Hi, my name is Jose Sadsevo, and let me begin this demonstration by thanking um, the Honolulu Ohara chapter, the II chapter, and the Ohara study group for inviting me to give this demonstration and share a passion I have for Ohara Ikebana with all of you. So I'm going to be making several arrangements and kind of giving you a tour of the various styles that we um, create in Ohara. And I'm going to start at the very beginning. If you were to come to a class for the first time, you would be making what we call the rising form. And in this form, there are two main elements, a subject and an object. The name says it's rising, so the movement needs to be vertical. So let me begin. Um, another thing I'd like to mention is for the last year and a half, I've challenged myself to use material that is growing in my garden. I don't have a large garden, but I have an Ikebana garden, which means every piece of dirt is planted with something. And I never trim anything unless I'm going to use it for an exhibition or a demonstration, sometimes for class. So I'm going to begin with what's growing in our front yard is just the last of the cosmos. So as I mentioned, uh, we have two main elements. This is going to be my subject and it's a rising form. So I am going to have it grow in its natural form, natural direction, and I'm going to insert it there. The second element that we have is called the object. And so for that, I'm going to use uh, this marigold. So let me trim it. And there are specific guidelines on where we place the subject and the object. Okay. We then say we have this imaginary dome that allows us to place any filler or ashirai within that dome. So that means if I want to maybe add a little more of the cosmos in the front, I can do that. Let me to help support that. And so, as I mentioned, this is considered a beginning form, but what a lot of students don't, don't realize is it doesn't have to be just uh, for beginners. Those are the only two branches that have guidelines on the way to replace them. Everything else you can choose what you want to insert as long as it's within that dome. So in this case, I have some monstera leaves from my garden and I thought this would create an interesting movement. Okay. And again, I want to make sure the overall feel of the arrangement is in a rising movement. So I'm hoping that this creates that rising movement. Let me add maybe another marigold. And an accent of a slight, of a different color of cosmos, this darker purple. And this I'm going to use to help blend the materials so that the cosmos isn't just in one area, but it's actually blending in, or as I like to say, playing with the other material.
One more. I'm adding this purple one. I've decided to add it in the back. What I'm hoping is that a viewer will see the color, first the dark purple, and their eye will then catch that same color in the back. It gives your arrangement a sense of depth and movement. It kind of forces the viewer to sort of look through your entire arrangement and not just at one area. Okay, so this would be a rising form, typically considered a beginner's style. So once we've completed studying the beginner's form, we then move on to what we call the uh, the styles, the Moribana styles. And so in this case, I will be making an upright style in a basket. Um, and unlike the beginner's form, these styles have three main elements. There's a subject, a secondary, and the object. So let me get started. Um, I'm actually using both sheep bows and Kenzons in the container. Okay, here we go. I also have, I'm going to be using a sheet bow to um, keep the large chrysanthemums in place. If you're a student of Ohada, uh, learn to love the sheet bows. It will make your life a lot easier because there are certain materials that just hold better and are stabilized better in a sheet bow than in a Kenzon. And one of those is a large headed chrysanthemum. So this is my subject or shushi. See. This will be my secondary. here. Now again, this is to Ohara students, get in the habit of checking your stem and cleaning it, removing any dead leaves, any little notches that are coming out of the flowers. It will make your arrangement look so much better. Okay, um, I'm actually using I have already pre-cut some parts of the stem that I can use to insert into the sheet bow, which then allows me to create a different angle. So again, learn to love these. Okay, so there we have our subject and our secondary. Our object now will be on your far right. And for that, I'm going to use these purple chrysanthemums. Okay, and again, here I noticed I have a little flower. At, I'm gonna remove that. I'm gonna clean it as, as, as much as I can. And I probably should have done this before I started rolling the video, but that's all right. Okay. It's, I tell my students doing this, checking the stems, cleaning them, is what separates Ikebana from just putting beautiful flowers in a container. You're now taking the time to look at it and making sure the stem and the flower is as beautiful as it can be. Okay, so. And so this has various helpers, so I'm just going to maybe a little helper, checking the stem. Yeah.
Now, if I weren't in my home, uh, you know, kind of comfortable doing this video, I would be sure that I had a bowl of water and I'd be cutting these under the water. Um, I don't know if it's because I'm home, I'm getting a little lazy in doing that, but uh, it's actually been cool here. And so, although it's still important to do, it's much more important if it's a warm day. And because these are so large, I'm going to use five chrysanthemums, these smaller chrysanthemums. So, subject, secondary, object. That leaves a lot of space here. So, I'm going to actually use uh, three more materials to help fill in. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to play with the color. And perhaps what I'll do first is, no, let me do this. Let me use this yellow, orange tinted Celosia as a middle material. And one thing we, we always want to make sure when, when we're making some of these groups is to make sure things are not lined up. So we're always, I'm always telling my students, go in, go out, go in to zigzag as you go through the arrangement so that everything has its place. Maybe one more. Okay. Now that's okay, but I'm going to actually add a little bit of color to help blend the, the various materials. And so one of those will be this solidago. And so maybe between this golden chrysanthemum and the yellow celosia, I'll add this brighter yellow. And what I'm trying to do with this material is just blend it a little bit. Blend one color with the next. And then finally, as I mentioned at the beginning, what I would like to do is use things from my garden, if I can, in all arrangements that I'm making. And so today, I'm going to use this September aster that is blooming in my yard. One of the few things that's blooming. Again, to now soften 
or help blend. So here we have an upright style using five materials in a basket. So once we get comfortable with making arrangements in Moribana, in a low ball, we then start studying how to make arrangements in a tall vase. And in a tall base, we don't use any kenzons. We always use what we call tome or crossbars or vertical stays. And so uh, when I was going through my garden in the last week, trying to figure out the arrangements I would be making, I noticed that our uh, cotone aster uh, has overgrown and I needed to cut it back. And actually I've been wanting to cut it back for a couple of years, but like any good Ikebana person, I never trim anything unless I absolutely know I won't use it. So I got to uh, use it today, so I was able to trim it. And it, for this arrangement in this tall vase, it's all gonna be about color. Okay. I wanted to sort of uh, show the colors of the seasons, or you know, if I lived in Connecticut, what the colors would be. So uh, the cotoneaster, the berries are orange. They'll, I guess, turn red as the weather gets a little cooler. Anyway, so, what I want to do is I actually want to place this main stem something like this. In order to do that, I'm going to have to secure it. And the way we do it is, as I mentioned, we used a crossbar. So let me cut it. And the first thing to do is cut it so that when it hits the wall, it's flush against the wall. I'm now going to give it a split. Okay. I then get another branch okay and what i'm going to do with this is i'm going to insert it and then this is actually going to go into the vase and it will hit the container in two places one will be sort of on this side up here and then the main stem will hit at a third point which will be on the rim of the container having it touch in three points makes the the branch pretty stable so let me Famous last words. So let me try to get this in there. I've created a little notch at the top so that I can insert, oops, insert the branch into the stay into the branch. And I'm actually gonna secure it just to be on the safe side, okay? It's probably okay if I hadn't, but material seems to know when you're doing a demonstration and it'll play tricks on you. That's why sometimes you'll hear demonstrators say, well, funny, it, it, it worked in the garage when I did it. Uh, so, as I say, when I insert it, I'm hoping it'll hit here, back here, and then stabilize. This is where you kind of hold your breath, you insert it, position it, and then let it go. Okay, so I think this is, I think to show this sharp angle. I'll remove that. So that's my main branch. And we have various styles of upright, slanting, cascading. But in this case, I'm just going to sort of create a, a free expression. So it's almost a freestyle in a tall vase. So that's going to be my main stem. But 
because it's going forward, I'm going to want to balance it by bringing some of the material back. And again, it's about color and so I am going to keep as many of the berries as I can. And so this was the style that made me realize I either need to relax or I need to quit studying because I used to come to class right after work uh, and I would, I would get there at six in the evening and the class ended at nine and I would leave at nine. And especially when we started doing tall vase arrangements, it would take me three hours and a lot of frustration to get things to stay. And then one day I finally realized I wasn't enjoying it. And so I remember sitting out in my truck ready to go home and thinking, next week I either need to let it all go or I need to stop because I don't need any more stress in my life. And so um, the very next week I let it go. And once I was able to just relax, things started to come together. And so I have the Cotone Aster. I then went into my garden and I found some Dracaena that again, I've been wanting to use. And for this, it's really, I just like the movement that it creates. And so maybe I'll have some here. Same thing. I'm going to try and insert a tome or vertical stay that will stabilize the branch. Okay. Maybe another one coming forward like that. And I tell my students that there's no magic here. It really is just practicing. So, yeah, you know, I tell them not to get discouraged. It is, it can be frustrating. I understand. But to just don't let it get you down. And then I show them as I work on their arrangements when I'm correcting it, things don't always stay for me, but that's okay. Um, you know, I tell them it's not brain surgery. No one will die if I make a mistake. So I am willing to try things and if I make a mistake, I learn from them. So that sort of sets the background. And so now what I want to do is I want to use these Bird of Paradise. And if you've seen any of my demonstrations or uh, either online or in person, you'll hear me say that one arrangement in the demonstration, at least one, will have, a f I'll try to use a flower that I remember my mom really liked. So when I was growing up, there were three flowers in particular, three plants that my mom loved. Roses was one, hydrangea was another, and bird of paradise was a third. So we always had those three plants in our yard. And so when I'm making a, when I'm planning a demonstration, I try to use one of those flowers in at least one arrangement. And in this case, um, for me, one of the prettiest parts of the flower of the bird of paradise is the red on the, right here on the neck of the flower. I think it's a beautiful shade of raspberry, raspberry red. And so I tend to try to show that. Oh. 
So let me readjust. And again, this is, this is what happens. It's all K. And for this, I'm using these bamboo skewers and I'm placing it pretty close to the edge so that when I place it in, it stabilizes the branch. Now let me see if I can add this Dracaena back in. Yep. Okay. I have one more bird of paradise I'm going to add. And this one I'm going to draw back a little bit to again get a sense of depth. Okay. So I really want to emphasize the orange. And so at this time of year, uh, we can find marigolds at the market. And so I'm going to add some marigolds. To really pick up on the color of the bird of paradise. I'm removing a lot of the leaves and side stems. Uh, if you're not careful with the leaves or the, the little stems that go to the side, it will make the arrangement look a little too busy. One final material is to sort of brighten it up. And for that, I'm going to use Oncidium. So let's see. Okay. Finally, I think I would like to add a little more of the Catoni Aster. 
maybe cascading down here. And so I'm going to try to manipulate the branch a little bit to get the angle I need. And then insert it. Please keep holding your breath. We're not done yet. And here we go. A tall vase or heka arrangement using autumn colors. When I first had Master Unshin Ohara develop these low bowl containers, these suibans, he greatly increased the possibilities of the types of arrangements we could create. In particular, he realized and the following headmasters realized they could create natural scenes and then bring those scenes into your home, what we now call landscape arrangements. So what I'm going to do is make a, a realistic landscape arrangement. And my intent is not to recreate exactly what you would see in nature, but recreate the impression or create an arrangement that gives you the impression that you have when you're out in nature and you see a scene. So in this particular case, I'm thinking it's autumn. You're in the woods taking a hike or taking a stroll. You stop and you look down and this is what you might see. So I'm going to begin by bringing this piece of dried uh, weeping mulberry. So let me insert this. And what I want to do is sort of create sort of the undergrowth of what you're going to see. And so perhaps a tree has fallen or a large branch has, has broken off a, a nearby tree and fallen and things are now growing around it. So let me begin. And what I'm using here is actually a uh, crepe myrtle from my yard. My first experience with realistic landscape came before I even started studying. Uh, I went to uh, Ikebana International Exhibition and there was a landscape arrangement with a single maple leaf floating in the water. And the moment I saw that maple leaf, it immediately took me back to several years before when I had seen a Japanese garden in England. And I was so amazed that an arrangement could take me thousands of miles away to a time where I was um, traveling, youth hostling through Europe and England. And that was the first time I thought I need to learn to do that. I need to learn to create an arrangement that takes someone from where they are to some place they've been or some place they want to be in nature. So let me see what else I have here. And so what I'm doing is I'm creating a framework. And then from that framework, other things will emerge. I tell my students to go out into nature to see how things are growing. You will discover if you take a closer look that um, you'll see things growing from within other uh, Plants. So there may be a large bush and from that bush uh, another tree material is growing, um, some flowers may be growing. And so uh, you know the, the, the saying that Ikebana is made with your feet. That doesn't mean you kick off your shoes and start 
arranging flowers with your toes, although I still think that would be a great party game. It means walk out in nature, see what nature has to offer, and in the process, your arrangements become much better. Okay, so that's the start of the framework. I'll be adding more things, but I think for now, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that. What inspired me to make this arrangement were some irises that were growing in my yard. And they're done growing, but after they bloom, they then get these beautiful red berries. And so that inspired me to create this arrangement. And so for me, these irises sort of set the tone An important aspect of creating realistic landscapes is understanding sort of where the sun is or in what direction the wind is blowing. Because if you go out into nature, you will see plants will, you know, search out the sun. And in many cases, the wind will, will alter the direction of some of the branches. And so we try to Think about those things when trying to recreate a scene. Another interesting aspect that you notice if you go out into nature and you take a look is most things will grow towards the sun, but there are always branches that sort of grow away in the opposite direction looking for the sun. There may be a branch above them that's, that's um, shading them, and so they'll grow in another direction, and eventually, once they get high enough, will grow in the direction of the sun. So we want to mimic that, where not everything is headed in the same direction, but the general direction of these plants is towards the sun, with an understanding that some of the branches, some of the material, has to, uh, has to do a little work to, to actually find some sun sh sunshine. Let's see. I also want to show some of the leaves that are broken or bent. Again, it could have been uh, a bird that landed on it. It could have been the wind that broke the leaves. But it's always good if you can show that it makes the overall impression feel like the season.
I'm going to add a little more undergrowth. Sometimes branches don't want to cooperate. I probably should have a sheeple here, uh, but I don't, and so I'm going to make do. Okay. Now what I want to add is, it's not only the irises that have grown from this fallen tree, perhaps there are um, other plants that have also found enough sunshine during the summer or the spring and are now showing their age. It's really important when creating these arrangements that you focus on where the roots of any particular plant is so that uh, the roots of this hosta all are centered here and things are expanding from it. I like to use lighter colors down low. Um, it helps your eye sort of focus and see things towards the bottom of the arrangement or the center of the arrangement. It gives you a sense of depth and a sense of shadow. Using a, um, a bug-eaten leaf also, again, helps you get the impression of the season. Let's see. So, my impression of walking in the woods on an autumn morning, stopping, looking down, and seeing things growing from perhaps a fallen tree or a fallen branch. For my final arrangement, I'll be making a rimpa style arrangement. So the rimpa style was developed by the third headmaster, Hoon Ohara, after he studied uh, many of the rimpa paintings of the 16th and 17th century. And if you've seen any of these paintings, they're usually on fans or screens. They're very two-dimensional. There's not much a sense of depth. Um, they are, in general, uh, the theme are flowers. There may be branches, but many times the branches is sort of a connecting material between the various groups of flowers. Um, there's also this sense of elimination. So in many of these paintings, they'll eliminate most of the plant and just show the flowers. So they exaggerate the beauty of the flowers. And so we try to mimic that 
impression in a Rimpa style arrangement. And so I'm going to begin by creating the branches that will connect the various groups in this arrangement. And for that, I'm going to be using this painted maple. Um, so I found this and I thought it would be nice. There are hints of orange and red in the maple, which gives you the sense of the season. So let me just begin. And in this particular style, it's all about the decorative aspects of the flowers. We don't necessarily arrange them how they would grow naturally, although you can. Uh, it's really about how they show the beauty of the actual flower. So in many cases, all the flowers are fully open. They're very flat to mimic that sense that you see in the paintings. So I'm just sort of adding these maple leaves to give a sense of movement between one group of material and the next. And one thing we will do in the Rimpa style that we typically don't do in Ohara is we will have the material very flat again, to mimic that sense of two dimensions that you see in the paintings. So where in other styles and most other styles, we will angle the material so that you may see a profile of the branches or of the flowers in here, it's okay to show a very flat surface. And I'm going to zigzag the, the branch material coming in, coming out, coming in, coming out. Okay. And that should be okay for right now. So I'm going to have two major groups of flowers. Um, one will be these chrysanthemums and the other will be this celosia or cox, coxcomb. And as I mentioned, typically we would use the material like this where you wouldn't create a flat surface. But in this case, it's all about the beauty of the flowers. So we want to show the flowers completely in a very flat sense. So it used to be when creating these arrangements, we never added um, buds. It was always fully open flowers. As they studied more and more of the Rimpa paintings, they discovered that there are paintings where some of the uh, side view, uh, there's a side view of the material or the flowers, or there's a uh, some buds being shown. So now we're allowed to create arrangements with both viewing from the side, viewing a flower from the side, or, um, or, or showing buds, which like, as I mentioned previously, we tried to avoid. And again, very flat in the sense of we want to show the the actual beauty of the, of the flower. You can still create a sense of depth. There's not by sort of positioning flowers slightly forward, slightly behind. Okay. So let me see. I'm going to add a second group of the coxcomb. Let's see, maybe like this. I'm also using very seasonal materials. So, you know, we're in 
um, the middle of October, so we're already into the autumn. And so these are the materials I was able to find at the flower market. The maple is not from the market. That's from some, um, some midnight gardening that I call, which means I found some, and some of it was hanging over a sidewalk. And so if you go when it's dark and you trim a little bit, um, I think that's okay. Okay, so let me start right there with the uh, celosia or coxcomb. The next material I wanna add is the, these beautiful chrysanthemums. And same thing, what I wanna do is I wanna make sure the chrysanthemum flowers show. So I'm gonna add them. And our rimpa style arrangements are, cate are categorized um, into either being fan shape or what we call circular. Now the, the paintings themselves weren't, didn't have those categories, but the, paint, but the arrangements do. So a fan shape is the overall shape of the arrangement will be in the shape of a fan, which is right, comes out and then up. Um, in the circular form, uh, which you see in, in Rimpa paintings, there are groups of material and then nothing in another group of materials and then nothing in another group of materials. And so we can mimic that in a Rimpa style arrangement by simply um, not having the center be the tallest. So if this, the, lar the tallest part of the arrangement were on one side, the overall look would be what we would call circular. One group, sort of a second group, a third group, and so forth. And many times there's a very little blending of material. So one material sort of stays in its own group. There is though, if you look at, at some of the Rimpa paintings, some blending. And so we also allow a little bit of blending of the groups. So here's our chrysanthemum. We're going to put a little chrysanthemum in the group right next to it. And again, what's most important is the decorative aspect of the material. Okay, so let me add this back. And so now I'm going to add some other types of chrysanthemums. So in this case, I have these purple chrysanthemums and I'm going to start forming another group. Let me cut some of these down so it makes it easier. Okay. Okay. Now, what I also am going to add is I'm going to add this yellow chrysanthemum. One, I like this yellow. If you see many of the um, screens that have Rimpa paintings, many times there's a lot of gold leaf. And I like how the yellow kind of mimics that. And so I'm not really going to make a group out of it. I'm going to use it more as a color that will flow through the arrangement.
these arrangements can be very ornate, very, like I said, decorative. Uh, I sort of consider them uh, the sort of the Rococo of Japanese paintings and arrangements, where it's really over the top sometimes uh, with the color and the material. Very striking. Uh, people l always love to look at a Rimpa arrangement. Okay. I'm notorious for always losing my clippers, so um, I'm shocked that I haven't lost it yet, lost them yet. So the next thing is, as I mentioned earlier in the demonstration, one of the themes I wanted to get through in all of my arrangements is to use materials I have here in my garden. So. I don't have the Sologia, I don't have the uh, chrysanthemums, but I do have a uh, September aster. Right. So uh, right now it's blooming or Monte Cassino. And again, I am going to use it, one, as a little group here. But also as a material to connect this side of the arrangement. As you work more and more with your arrangements, what you'll discover is you need to become ambidextrous. You need to be able to use both your right hand and your left hand um, if you want to make some of these arrangements, especially from behind. And so now what I want to do is I want to bring just a little bit of the aster to the other side. Maybe a little bit more here. And actually, so if you've counted the materials, and I hope you haven't, but if you have, you may notice I have one, two, three, four, five, six. Six materials. Uh, three colors of, of um, chrysanthemums, two colors of celosia. So I need one more. And in this case, I'm going to use miscanthus or eulalia. And we use this strictly for decorative purposes. And it's a design aspect you'll see in many Japanese uh, fabrics or paintings or designs. And they're the waves. And the waves are created simply by um, lines that sort of overlap, semicircles that so, sort of overlap. And so we do that in Rimpa to show that same sense. It creates a sense of movement. It's not really meant to be um, naturalistic or anything but decorative. And so we'll take individual blades of the miscanthus and insert them.
to create the wave design. So, a Nohara Rimpa arrangement. So, that concludes my demonstration for today. Let me again thank the uh, Honolulu Ohara chapter, the Ikebana International. Honolulu chapter number 56 and the Ikebana Institute of Ohara School for allowing me to give this demonstration. When I give a demonstration, there are a couple of things I'm hoping for. One, I hope you actually enjoyed watching me create these arrangements. But more importantly, I hope you're inspired to go into your garden, a friend's garden, or to the market, gather material, and create your own Ikebana arrangement whether it's the Ohara school or some other school. So I want to thank all the Honolulu Ikebana enthusiasts for allowing me to come into your home and share my passion for Ohara Ikebana with you. Arigatou gozaimashita.